First of all, Q, I'd like to welcome you to my show. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate I'm so it. excited to have you here. You, as well. you know, um, there is so much that I will ask you because you are the entertainment guru, uh, <laughs> connector, liaison uh, extraordinaire, and I know that our audience will really be entertained by your story and a lot of things that you have to share today. I sure hope so. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me introduce you and myself to the audience. Hello, everyone. My name is Susan Lee McDonald, and welcome back to the interview. I am super psyched to have Q Lee on our show today. You're going to have a real treat in store for you because we are going to find out all about the Hollywood and the Korean entertainment industry through none other than Q Lee. Q Lee a Hallyu content producer. Known widely for his connections in the Korean and U.S. entertainment industries, Q Lee played a pivotal role in bringing Psy and his sensational Gangnam style to the States. He began his career at Sony Pictures as an assistant and then a marketer and distributor. And after watching the inspiring movie Taegeoki in 2004, he took on his first project taking a Korean movie abroad. Since then, he has been a behind-the-scenes force in Hallyu, helping top stars break into the American market. He is currently a producer for the girl group Blush, praised as the Spice Girls of Asia, and continues to be an important presence in the film, music, and sound industries, as well as in the development of Hallyu. Q Lee, a person who helps lead the way in new collaborations between the U.S. and Korean entertainment industries. Join me, Susan Lee McDonald, and hear about his experiences and insights on this week's The Interview. So, people know you here in Korea and they know you in Hollywood for being uh, having been in the music and movie industry and knowing basically everyone in the industry. Now, that doesn't come easily. Not everyone has those kinds of contacts. And uh, I'm just curious, you know, how it was that uh, you decided to go into this type of entertainment business? You know, I tell you what, I can't, I can't give credit all to myself. Um, I think it's a, it's a collaboration of having uh, extraordinary bosses uh, that uh, I cannot not mention and uh, a lot of good friends around me that have built who I am today. Um, I don't think anyone can succeed on their own and uh, for me it, it's been a lot of luck and uh, I've been blessed to have really good friends within the industry that have helped me get to where I am today. So. I think that's what it is, really. That's a humble response, but you know, you're really the guy that everyone in the world has to be thankful for, for <laughs> having the Gangnam style horse riding dance just become oh. a craze. Uh, I know that you and the story between you meeting Sai, as well as you getting Sai uh, over to the States, is a pretty unique story. So tell us about that. Well, you know what? It kind of happened overnight. Uh, I got a phone call from a gentleman by the name of Scooter Braun. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a relationship uh, throughout the years uh, through mutual friends. Mm -hmm. and, and he's um, Justin Bieber's manager. Exactly. Yes? Okay. Justin Bieber's manager. He also represents uh, Carly Rae Jepsen mm -hmm. and a group call from the maybe. UK. <laughs> yeah, call me maybe. Um, a group from the UK called The Wanted. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's an extraordinary business guy. Mm -hmm. um, he knows how to balance what he has and leverage off the content that he has mm -hmm. and um, he's been very good at that and I thought you know he would be perfect for someone like Sai. Um, how it happened was uh, he watched the video yes, just by chance and he recognized that Sai was Korean mm. and uh, he called me one day um, late July. I and see. Uh, he that goes was about two weeks after the release of the music video right? Right. Yeah. July 15th was the release of the video on mm -hmm. YouTube and uh, a couple weeks later he watched it online and he called me and he goes, hey Q, do you know this guy named PSY? And I was half asleep at the time because it was like mm. 3 in the morning, I think, Korea <laughs> time. And I was thinking, who? I don't know what you're talking about, PSY. And I thought about it for a couple more seconds and I realized, are you talking about Psy? He's like, yeah, Psy or a PSY, it doesn't matter. I want the song. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of how it started. I see. Yeah. Wow. So 
he contacted you, he wanted to know who Sai was, he wanted that contact, and did you know Sai prior to no, that? No, you know, I didn't know Sai personally, mm -hmm. so uh, I thought about it for a couple days, and uh, I came across uh, calling um, Yoon do mm -hmm. who's a pretty well-known rock star here yes. in Korea. and he has uh, his own TV show too. He yes. has his own TV show. Um, but anyway, I thought he might be the perfect person to call, and he's kind of like a mentor, um, mm. older brother figure to me here in Korea. So, uh, you know, lo and behold, he knew who he was and, and made the introduction. Uh, we met the next day and uh, told him about the deal yes. and uh, who Scooter was. And I said, uh, you know, it might be in your best interest that we go to L.A. Mm -hmm. And uh, we agreed and we flew over. When you flew over to L.A., what happened? Well, I tell you what, I flew in a day early uh, to meet Scooter and the folks and uh, kind of discuss, you know, what could possibly be. I mean, at the beginning of it, uh, Scooter just wanted the rights to the song, kind of style. Really? And, uh, you know. I can't see Cy giving that up. No, y you know what, I think, uh, not just giving it up, I don't think Cy understood the reason why. Mm. Um, I think uh, he was more surprised that someone outside of Korea saw the song Mm. and heard the song and wanted the song. And um, I think actually Sai did a background check on me before he decided to go to LA because I <laughs> did get a few phone calls yes. um, from some close people asking if I had a problem with him or something because he was oh. asking about me. Um, <laughs> Just to check out that you were right, if that I was legit. on the up and up, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I went a day early and then you know I told Scooter, I said, you know, anybody and everybody can just buy the song and just make a remix or whatever, but how about I hand deliver you the guy? I'll bring him wow. from Korea so you can meet him, and rather than just buying the track, why don't you do a collaboration with all the people that you've been doing business with mm -hmm. for the past 10, 20 years? Wow. And, um, you know, Scooter, as a good businessman he is, he saw the value in that, yes. and then we started making some phone calls. And uh, the next day, he picked up Sai from there, or went straight to Scooter's house for a nice lunch, and mm -hmm. uh, we hit it off really well. That's fantastic. Now, when you heard the song Gangnam Style first, uh, what did you think about the song? I thought it was funny. I thought it was fun. Um, you know, at first I didn't think much of it because I'm more of a ballad guy. I like mm -hmm. listening to slow jams and, mm -hmm. and classical music and jazz, and I was never into uh, the club stuff or the mm -hmm. partying stuff or the house techno music. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, maybe I have an older mind, um, <laughs> but, uh, old soul. yeah, maybe an old soul, but, uh, you know, I thought it was a very interesting video. I think, uh, a lot of credit is due, not to just Sai, but the director of that music video, um, that I've never met, but the guy's a genius. I mean, I think, uh, with, with Sai's talent and his, uh, music genius, um, it also has a lot to do with the choreographer of the video, yes. the choreographer of the, of the dance, um, the way that the video is made via the creativeness of the director. Mm -hmm. um, I think without that, it wouldn't be where it is today. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I would applaud those people that were involved. Absolutely. I'd like to learn a little bit more about uh, what you have done uh, career-wise because it doesn't just happen overnight for you to have certain kinds of connections mm -hmm. and I'd like to be able to know, uh, you know, where were you born, how did you grow up, where did you grow up, and a little bit more about your background. Uh, I was born here. I was born in Itaewon in Yongsan. Okay. On the U.S. military base. Oh, so are, uh, were you a military brat? No, I wasn't. My dad was a... Uh, part of the U.S. Army mm -hmm. since 1955, but he was kind of in and out as a reserve and mm. a liaison to the government, and, uh, and I happened to be born there when, the, when my parents were having lunch or they were visiting on the, on the base, and you know, the closest hospital was on base, and that's oh where goodness. I was. <laughs> so uh, that's where I was born. Um, I was in Dongbui Chandong for a little while. I see. And then when I was about two, three years old, I moved to Seattle. I see. And. Uh, that's where I grew up, Wow. Mercer Island. One of the things that I think is interesting is that after going to UW, 
you decided to go to Los Angeles to work in right. the entertainment industry. Right. And I remember during our pre-interview yesterday, <laughs> you had two separate kinds of stories about right. your beginning. Now, right. would you be willing to share both stories? I can, I can share both stories. Okay. Uh, well, the first story is uh, when I was, uh, as soon as I graduated in college, mm -hmm. um, I took a couple months off and uh, I had to look for a job. Mm -hmm. And I decided that I would try LA out because I've been in, uh, isolated in Seattle all my life mm -hmm. and it, I, I lived a very quiet life. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to see what was out there. So I visited down in, uh, sometime around March of 2001, I mm -hmm. visited LA to go see a friend. And in the process, I printed out about 300 resumes to start dishing off to all mm -hmm. the various companies that I've always wanted to uh, possibly work with. It was a tough spot. You know, you're just out of college, and you're trying to figure out what to do, and uh, you, you just try to take what you can get mm -hmm. at that time. You mm -hmm. know, anything entry level as an assistant or in the mail room, um, something to get your foot in the door mm -hmm. so that you can build something for yourself. I think was important yes. um, back then, and even today. I mean, that's that's how most people start mm -hmm. their careers. Um, so I started dishing resumes off to. Universal, Paramount, Sony, um, EMI, Sony BMG, um, all these various entertainment companies. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the LA Lakers or, or the Los Angeles Dodgers, anywhere that I had an interest in, mm -hmm. I, I put a resume out. And what was the response? You know, you would get these, uh, you would get these things in the mail saying, uh, we have received your resume, we'll keep it on file for six months, and if anything opens up, we'll give you a call. Mm -hmm. But I know, at the end of the day, that's just uh, you know, corporate policy to mm -hmm. you know give feedback to people that that send in mail to mm -hmm. uh, certain companies. So um, I just knew that was like a nice way of saying uh, thanks, but no thanks. Yes. But um, you know that was totally okay. I mm -hmm. was just excited that okay, I sent a resume and I got a reply back. That's mm -hmm. all I really cared about. And then from there, I could cross off things and mm -hmm. move on to the next mm -hmm. step. So, um, but it doesn't seem like you're the type of person to give up too easily. <laughs> right. I keep them in my back pocket. Yeah. And uh, when the timing's right, I'll go back to them. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, you just try to keep as many options open as you can and mm -hmm. take the best one that, that, that sees fit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I never, I didn't get a, much of a good response from anywhere. Mm. Um, but it also happened to be the same weekend of the Academy Awards. Oh, the Oscars, nice. Yeah, 2001. Mm -hmm. um, that year, Steve Martin was the host. That was it's when uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was Correct, there. that's when Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was uh, won two Oscars yeah. that mm -hmm. year. Um, so the first story is uh, I was visiting LA and... Uh, so this is the uh, official story up until now. <laughs> right, the official story <laughs> up until now. Uh, I was invited uh, by a fellow actor, mm -hmm. a friend of mine, uh, named Chang Chen. That mm -hmm. was uh, that was the story. Um, he was one of the lead actors in the movie, mm -hmm. and uh, he called me last minute because he knew I was in L.A. And uh, he said, "Hey, I got an extra ticket. You should come." Mm -hmm. So proudly, I accepted, mm -hmm. and I went to the party. And uh, he introduced me to a bunch of executives from Sony mm -hmm. and people involved in the movie. Mm -hmm. And one thing that led to the next, um, and I ended up getting a job at Sony Pictures. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, that's story number one. Fantastic. So what's the actual real story, if that's the official story? Because parts of that are actually true. It's all true. Okay. Um, it, it, it's all true, except a couple of things were a little exaggerated. Okay. Um, I have to know. <laughs> what, what really happened was uh, my friend had told me that the Oscars was uh, on a certain weekend, the weekend okay. that I was there, which was March 23rd, I believe, mm -hmm. of 01. And, uh, I found out where the Oscars was. It was mm -hmm. at the Shrine Auditorium. Mm -hmm. um, and so the day before the Oscars, I went around the block to, to scope out, you know, where it was because, I, you know, I'm not from L.A., mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, I did kind of know more my, my surroundings. Mm -hmm. So I went there, uh, and they were already setting up for the Oscars. Okay. The production teams and the crew and the staff and the police, they were mm -hmm. getting ready to barricade certain roads off and, and set up all the red carpet and all the festivity um, materials and whatnot. Yeah. 
And um, well, that must have been pretty exciting for you to kind of go. It was. And it was exciting. It was surreal on. for me because you, you don't get to see stuff like that in person, mm -hmm. um, especially being a Seattle boy. But um, I scoped it out, uh, and I tried to figure out, okay, what do I have to do in order to get into this party without mm -hmm. being invited? <laughs> Basically, you're planning to crash the Oscars. Ex exactly. <laughs> so um, I found out where people were parking, where people entered, mm -hmm. uh, where, where the actors would be coming through, all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, I actually went into a parking lot, and I saw an open convertible, and I took a, I took an Oscar pass out of the, out of the car. <laughs> it was like a parking pass. Oh my goodness, um, that's awesome! So I was like, oh, I could probably use this probably tomorrow when I come back. I mean, not that I should condone theft, <laughs> but that's pretty genius. <laughs> right. So I went, went in there and I got this yellow pass. I wish I could have brought it, um, but it's in Seattle right now. But um, I kept all that stuff for memories down the awesome. down the line. Um, so I got a pass, so I had a I had a place to park. Mm. Um, I had a I had a I had a free pass to get through traffic and wow. to get the right parking spot to park at the Oscars. So uh, that was step number one. Um, step number two, I needed a suit, I needed a black suit. But I came down for interviews anyhow, so yes. I had one. Um, Conveniently enough. Correct. Yeah. And so I went back home and waited for the next day. And, uh, what were about, you thinking during that day before? Were you doubting whether you should go or not? No, no, no. I, I had no doubt in my mind that um, to not go. I, I wanted to go for sure, and mm -hmm. it never crossed my mind to change my mind. Um, I was just wondering, okay, what time and where and how am I going to get in was more, mm -hmm. more, the, more the question than anything else. So I, got, I took care of parking. I got my suit. I got the schedule. Now it's about getting in. Right. So, you know, I went there about two hours before um, the next day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in my suit looking good. Yeah. And uh, drove around a couple times, parked, mm -hmm. and then walked around a couple times to, to see what was going on. You could see yes. all these, you know, famous celebrities, Will Smith, Denzel Washington, mm -hmm. you know, all, all these celebrities that you could only dream of meeting mm -hmm. that you've only seen on TV. And... Um, then I was looking for my, my timing. Yes. And there was no way that I could walk on the red carpet because, you know, everyone security and passes and all this kind of stuff. Yes. And I didn't look like anything to be involved in the Oscar. So I walked around the back. Okay. <laughs> and like craft services and production people mm -hmm. running in and out of this gate. And uh, I saw a group of Asian people mm. outside having a smoke break. Oh, yeah. And they were all in their tuxedos, and it was like Chow Yun Fat and Michelle Yeoh and and the cinematographers and whatnot. All the people from the from Crouching Tiger, Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Oh my goodness! Okay. And uh, I was thinking to myself, oh, this has got to be, this has got to be it. This yes. has got to be my time. And um, I walked over towards the security guards that were blocking the gate yes. where everyone was in, and. Uh, kind of acted like I didn't speak any English, <laughs> like broken Chinese. Um, me, a uh, one to right, two, me, go. Yeah, over there, smoke, <laughs> my people, you know, it's like something like funny. that. And uh, very easily, like, oh, excuse me, sir, oh, please ha come inside. <laughs> it and, worked. And it worked. And I was in the back door of the Oscars, and I watched the whole event. Oh, my goodness. Um, so that was that adventure. Uh, wow. And then they won two Oscars. Incredible. And, but what about seating at the Oscars? I thought it was all kind of arranged. Well, it's taped. Okay. Uh, it's a taped show, so there's a lot of open seats. Really? Um, I mean, I didn't sit smack in the middle, but there mm -hmm. were some seats on the side where the camera wasn't panning. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I just kind of, I was kind of nervous when I got in there. And like, now what do I do? I got in, mm -hmm. what do I do now? Um, it's like I have my little disposable camera and my trying to take pictures of people, but yes. that didn't seem like the right thing to do mm -hmm. either. So. I just quietly sat in the back, and mm. if I looked as suspicious, then I would stand up and go somewhere else and sit somewhere else. And it was, <laughs> oh man, it was, uh, it was adrenaline pumping when I was I in there. I can only but imagine. It was the most surreal uh, event that I've ever had in my life. Wow. Um, one of one of the top three, I could probably say. Amazing. Um, and once they won the Oscars, which mm -hmm. they won two for. Yes. They won for artist direction and one for cinematography, and. Uh, 
everyone was celebrating like congratulations yes. and then they looked at me and they were saying congratulations like <laughs> I was part of the movie <laughs> um, and I what, what could I say I was like oh thank you <laughs> um, and then blended I, right in there I, blend, I tried to blend right in and That's then uh, and then they're like hey where's the party at and everyone's wondering where the party mm -hmm. is and uh, someone blurted out it's at crustacean in Beverly Hills mm -hmm. I was like Oh, are you coming? Like, oh, of course I'm coming. I'll see you there. <laughs> and uh, and that's where I went. Um, Did you know where this place was? Had you been there before? No, I didn't know where it was, so I just started asking people. I just drove towards Beverly Hills. But, um, you know, it was a, it was a collaboration of kind of using my head and, mm -hmm. and uh, waiting for the right timing. Yes. And uh, a lot of luck involved that, that made that possible. Um, and then getting into crustacean, I imagine, must have been going into crustacean. I thought would be another obstacle, but uh, you know, I had to go to the bathroom pretty bad at the time. <laughs> you know, I was holding it for quite a bit, uh, <laughs> and I asked the security guard at the front, "Where's the bathroom?" and and he just let me right in. He said, oh, "The bathroom's right around the back to your right." Nice. And. Uh, it's like perfect. Thank you so much. Oh, well, enjoy enjoy your evening, sir. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I definitely will. Thank you. You too. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone's uh, thinking that you're part of the Crouching Tiger, right? Um, like crew member or like small role as an actor. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they were thinking, but yes. um, everyone was so happy and excited. I think they all just kind of accepted me with open arms mm -hmm. um, at the event, and uh, you know, when everyone's drinking, having a good time, everyone's buddy buddy and um, without knowing who anyone is, just, uh, you know, without any kind of idea who anyone is, you yes. just say hello mm -hmm. um, very easily yes. and become friends at that moment because it's such a good, you know, it's a great gathering yeah. for, for an exciting It's win. not like they lost. They actually no, won no, no, two no, Oscars. Exactly. Everyone's excited. So no one I cared who who was. It was just, hey, nice to meet you. What's mm -hmm. going on? Let's party. Yeah. You know, that's all it was. And, uh, one thing that led to the next, and uh, I started getting introduced to mm -hmm. people. Let's say you and I met yet just just five minutes ago, yes. and there's someone next to us. Oh, this is my good friend Susan, and mm -hmm. and just all of a sudden people mesh. Yes. Um, that that was what the situation was at that party. Nice. Um, and that's how I met the Sony executive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think at the beginning he might have paid a little bit more attention to me because he may have thought that I was associated or, or a good friend or a family of mm -hmm. someone from the movie mm -hmm. so maybe he might have uh, you know paid a little bit more attention but yeah. at the end of the day I was just some kid on the street just that crashed the party um, <laughs> so from that time you contacted uh, the Sony executive uh, what every day or very often to uh, three four times a week yes you know um, I went back to Seattle the following week because mm -hmm. I just came to visit um, and I just kept calling. Um, this is Q. We met at the party, remember? Uh, you said I could come visit. When can I come visit? Um, I want a job. Mm -hmm. I don't want a, a six-month letter saying uh, you'll check my resume and you'll send it back. Yes. I've been through that. Let's just pass over that and why don't you just find me a job there? <laughs> wow. You know, just all kinds of different responses mm -hmm. that I gave him. And, mm -hmm. and finally he gave in and uh, he met me, mm -hmm. uh, introduced me to HR, and they had two options for me. Rather, I work in IT or I work in post production. And I, nice. and I took the post production job. Wow. So, starting as uh, someone working in post production in Sony, um, what was your career at Sony like? Well, you know what? Um, Sony Pictures is like. It's still my second home. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not an affiliated employee of there anymore, but um, that's why I grew up. Mm -hmm. It was my second life out of, you know, out of living at home and, and being a student. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Sony was like grad school almost for me. Mm -hmm. um, I started in, uh, it's uh, somewhat post-production, but it's more creative advertising, creative marketing. Okay. And it was a trailer department, so we cut trailers Oh, nice. And we ship trailers to movie theaters to show for the preview, previews before movies. Oh, fun. So then working on trailers, uh, marketing, then uh, how long did you do that before you moved on to your next gig? Um, I worked for a gentleman by the name of Arthur Shapiro mm -hmm. for about a year and a half. And he's one of those bosses where um, he's not a dead-end boss. He's a boss where he likes to groom his, mm -hmm. his assistant or mm -hmm. people that work for him. Mm -hmm. And he knew for some reason that I didn't want to be a lifetime assistant. I think he yes. kind of saw the potential of where I could possibly mm -hmm. go mm -hmm. um, in a career in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
he took me aside one day and he told me, hey Q, this is, you know, this job is a dead end job. Mm -hmm. This job is not going to take you mm -hmm. anywhere. I think uh, you're bigger than this mm -hmm. and you should move on. Wow. And at first I thought he was just trying to fire me because yeah. he didn't need me anymore. Mm -hmm. but Did that make you nervous? It made me a little nervous because, you know, I was still only 22, 23 mm -hmm. at the time. And uh, I was loving my job, even mm -hmm. though I was just paper pushing and answering <laughs> phones. But yeah. I still really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. But what really he had in the back pocket was uh, another job. Mm. And uh, it happened to be... Uh, at Sony, too. Uh-huh. A job at Sony. What really he had in the back pocket was uh, another job. Mm. And uh, it happened to be... Uh, at Sony, too. Uh-huh. A job at Sony as uh, one of the second assistants of uh, the chairman of the company, who happens wow. to be a gentleman by the name of Jeff Blake. Wow. That's a huge step up. Right. And he had heard in a meeting uh, that he was in that Jeff needed a new assistant. Mm. Um, and he thought uh, I would be the perfect person for the job. Mm -hmm. And one thing that the next, next and uh, a week after, I was already working for the chairman of the studio. So you worked with Jeff Blake for how long after that? I worked for Jeff Blake for four and a half, five years. Okay. And um, I think I hit it off with him pretty good. Um, mm. you know, and all how, the, how is that possible? I mean, you know, you're, all the bosses, you're younger, he's so much older and experienced. All the bosses that I've had have been, um, they all hold a very dear place in my heart. Mm -hmm. um, they've all been very, not just a boss, but a boss that tells you what to do, mm -hmm. but a boss that mentors you into someone bigger and better. Mm -hmm. um, Arthur Shapiro, Jeff Blake, um, and Elizabeth Crotty, who's my next job mm -hmm. um, after that. I after I left Jeff Blake's office, all of them have been so supportive mm. of, of my career mm -hmm. um, at every aspect. And um, the reason, one of the reasons I got along with Jeff really well was he was a huge baseball fan. So you know we had that connection. Nice. We, we had something to talk about rather than just work. Yes. Um, so being at Sony, having those bosses um, as my mentors mm -hmm. was a huge, a huge part of my life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I still keep in contact with all three of them, mm -hmm. you know, on a monthly basis, even today. Nice. And um, I find ways to create synergy and build businesses around them as well. Mm. Um, so Sony. Uh, 10 years of Sony was a, a huge impact in my life. Wow. And once you left uh, Jeff Blake's office, then you went on to work with Elizabeth? I ended up working with uh, Anna Elizabeth Crotty. Okay. Um, she's a senior vice president in a division of marketing okay. that does in theater marketing. Yeah. Um, and so, so were you working um, uh, mainly in the US or did you do stuff elsewhere too? Now, this, this position was actually kind of created since we didn't have any eyes on mm -hmm. the home office side, mm -hmm. it was more just interaction and, and, and trafficking and communication between the U.S. and various countries we were working with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jeff and Anne Elizabeth had discussed, hey, why don't we just have an international department and have Q head that. Nice. And so... And at a young age, too. You at a young age. I was, uh, what, 20, 26, wow. 27. And... Um, they were, what the job was, was to travel all around the world to visit theaters. <laughs> tough and, job. Uh, <laughs> it was tough. It, it was uh, a lot of airtime. Yes. <laughs> a lot of jet lag. Yeah, I didn't know I what time it was. I didn't know what time zone it was. Mm -hmm. Well, given that, that you were so young doing that type of work, uh, I don't think that your bosses would have given you that type of responsibility uh, or that responsibility to anyone who they didn't think was capable. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't because you're just a nice guy. You obviously performed well enough for them that they thought that they could trust you with that. So how does it feel to feel trusted by these you know, kind of giants in the industry? It's, uh, it's definitely an honor. I think um, it benefited to actually me being an assistant to them. Mm -hmm to showing them how I organize myself and mm -hmm. how I organize their schedule mm -hmm. and how I put out fires or, or how I collaborate with other people and mm -hmm. treat other people. Mm -hmm. I, think, uh, um, I think they saw something like that and they believe that I might be good at dealing with mm -hmm. other cultures and other personalities yes. and, and make sure everyone's on the same page mm -hmm. and uh, achieve a common goal that we're mm -hmm. all trying to do. So maybe it was that or, or maybe they you know, we're just trying to get rid of me. I don't know. 
<laughs> but um, I don't, but it, I don't think but that's it worked the case. out. It worked out to everyone's benefit, mm -hmm. and it was definitely for me an, an exciting experience. That's fantastic. So doing a lot of that traveling, I, I imagine that you traveled to Korea a number of times. Sure. Uh, had you been interested at all in Korean movies? Had you been interested in uh, maybe somehow bringing Korean movies Definitely. to the West? Uh, 2004 was the first time that I was introduced to a Korean film. Uh, which one was that? Um, I watched a movie called uh, the, Brother the Brotherhood of War, mm. Taeguk-gi, Hwinayumya. That was a beautiful movie. Uh, it was directed by director Kang jae -gyu. Yes. And I was very uh, moved by the movie. Mm. Um, what was it that moved you about that movie? It was very, uh, not only the quality was amazing, just mm -hmm. the story and the way that Chang dong and Won Bin were mm -hmm. interacting. Mm -hmm. And the story itself was, um, it was moving, it was uh, mm -hmm. emotional. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was sad and it was uh, triumphant. It was a, a movie that had every element that you could possibly want in a movie. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I took that film back with me to the state, to back to the states, like in mm -hmm. my mind. Mm -hmm. Since at the time I was Jeff's assistant, mm -hmm. I wrote him a small little email, and um, and then I talked to him in person. I said, "Hey, I just sent you an email, um, but I wanted to talk to you about it as well." There's this movie that I saw called mm -hmm. Tegoki. Mm -hmm. It was amazing, and I found out about it. it only cost 14 million to make. Mm -hmm. It's a very Saving Private Ryan esque movie, mm -hmm. um, at like. A tenth of the cost. Wow. How did they do it? Mm. I mean, is there any way that we can, you know, re release it mm -hmm. or do DVD distribution, mm -hmm. you know, s create some kind of awareness? Because yes. it would be such a waste to let this movie go mm -hmm. without being noticed mm -hmm. um, outside, just in Korea. Mm -hmm. It deserves to have some kind of worldwide recognition. Yes. And, um, you know, he said, well, let's take a look at it. Mm -hmm. And then he, Dished it off to some executives over uh, that acquire mm -hmm. uh, movies, and uh, they ended up picking it up. Wow. This is a shopping mall within Gimpo Airport. The fifth installment of the popular Marrying the Mafia series is being filmed here. We see actors Chung Jun Ho and Kim Min Jung moving according to the director's instructions. Everyone is focused on the shoot, okay. and Q slips in. He stands and watches the shoot without a word. What brings him to the set at this hour? Coming to these kind of sets, I learn uh, how the Korean crew operates. So if I can adjust to that and learn how they operate, um, I think uh, it's a big advantage for me when I start doing my own projects. During break time, Q joins in on a conversation between producer Jung Tae-won and the actors. He finds a few moments to talk with Chung about upcoming movie projects. Q's schedule is usually packed down to the last minute. But whenever he finds extra time, he makes sure to drop by shoots like these to talk to the staff and learn more about Korea's movie making process. You know, I think um, Hollywood can learn a lot from Korea, and um, Korea can learn a lot from Hollywood. And I think if uh, you know, producers and, and actors and uh, <laughs> filmmakers can find a balance between how Koreans do business and how Americans do business. I think we can become a very huge global um, leader in, in entertainment. Let's talk about your work now. So you work with a company called STA. You also work with a uh, international girl group. It's like the Asian version of the Spice Girls. Yes, it's called right. Blush. Blush. Uh, great, great lineup of girls there uh, from different countries. Uh, so you're doing a lot of kind of contents production. Is that right? Right. Um, my main job is is um, producing film. That's okay. that's my dream job. That's what I okay. continue to want to do and am doing now. Um, so you have a few movie scripts that you guys are working right, on? Right, I'm working on two scripts right now. Okay. We're in the script process, so there isn't really much I can talk about at this time. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm working on two projects um, on the film side. Mm 
Um, I have my Go Group blush, mm -hmm. and I also have a company called STA, which uh, stands for Sonic Tear Audio. Okay, and what is that? Um, Sonic Tear Audio, mm -hmm. uh, in simple terms, is uh, is like Dolby. You've okay. heard of Dolby, yes. right? Yes. Uh -huh. um, you can just the stereo uh, system. Exactly. Yes. Think of it as a Korean-made Dolby. But better. Mm, I wouldn't say better, but uh, different. Okay. Different. Um, How is it different? Our speakers are uh, 30.2 and 14.2 uh, uh, channel speakers. Okay. So that means we have anywhere between, you know, uh, 15 to 70 speakers in one movie theater. Oh my goodness, that's a mm -hmm. lot. And uh, as opposed to what's a normal theater? Um, Dolby speakers are 5.1 channel, mm -hmm. um, and I think some have 7.1 and and whatnot, but. Um, we have a system where we call it moving objects. Okay. So we can kind of throw sound in any direction, coordinate sound from where dialogue or mm -hmm. sound effects are coming from Interesting. when you're watching on the screen. Wow. And, uh, and you guys are um, kind of fully patented with this technology? Right. And We're worldwide patented. Interesting. Um, our CEO of our company, uh, since 2006, uh, registered for or applied for 36 different patents, mm -hmm. and 17 of them he has today. And uh, nice. we've uh, put those technologies into our system, so it's uh, unique from other, other systems. On October 12th, there was a special event for sports fans in the plaza in front of Seoul City Hall. It was the 2012 NBA 3X Korea Street Basketball Competition. Participants of all ages were bringing their best game to the courts when we spotted an unexpected face in the crowd. Content producer Q Lee, a leader in the globalization of Hallyu. What is he doing at a basketball game? Um, I'm at this uh, NBA three-on-three -three tournament event today because uh, my girl group Blush from uh, Hong Kong is performing a few songs. It's, uh, it's really exciting. I mean, NBA is a, is a globally known uh, you know, pro basketball association. To be a part of something like that is, uh, is an honor. The event not only offered an opportunity to compete, but also to receive training directly from an NBA player. We're in here for the three um, NBA 3X 3-on-3 uh, three three tournament uh, to build a little bit more of the things out here for Korea. We want the basketball to get a little bit more skill. Hopefully that some um, kids or players can go over to the United States and, and have a future in the NBA. So we're all here just to help. With each passing minute, the excitement grows in the plaza. Passers-by stop to enjoy the dynamic performances. You know, in the back in the old days, and you know, uh, we hadn't seen each other in a long time, so uh, we came back in and rekindled with each other. With each passing minute, the excitement grows in the plaza. Passers-by stop to enjoy the dynamic performances. It's a festival for all, even those who aren't familiar with basketball. To one side of the event, we ran into girl group Blush, waiting for their turn on stage. Hi, we're Blush. Keep blushing. They seem to be a little jittery before their performance. Blush is a group that was personally produced and is being promoted by Q. <laughs> Audiences have crowded in front of the stage, eager to see the new group. And finally, Blush has taken the stage. They grab everyone's attention with powerful choreography from the start. And as the song progresses, the audience participates more and more. The fun and bubbly performance is over, and Blush is a success. 
<laughs> yeah, that was really, really impressive. Very uh, great dance and beautiful girls. It was really, uh, yeah, really good. Really enjoyed it. The performance went off without a hitch. Q comes by to congratulate the group on their success. Q Lee hopes to set new trends in culture by staying one step ahead and is always looking towards the future. Stars and fans alike are looking forward to see what cultural content he will bring to the table in the years to come. Um, I think that's a very simple question um, with a very simple answer. Uh, make as many friends as you can. Uh, make genuine relationships. Um, it can take you to the horizons. Um, you have friends from different cultures and different languages and different societies and uh, you learn how to adapt and become friends genuinely with those people. Uh, it's going to bring you a lot of wealth, um, not monetarily, but, um, but wealth as far as your wisdom and um, the, uh, the gift of friendship. And uh, that takes you a long ways. It's more than half the battle, I think. It's 80% of the battle. You earlier talked about your athleticism uh, a bit with your love for baseball. I'd like to learn a little bit more about that aspect of your life because you were involved in um, not only college level baseball, but you were also working with the Korea team for baseball. Mm -hmm. So tell me about your kind of progress through baseball and how you got here. You know, uh, everything in my life has never been very calculated. It all mm -hmm. kind of happened mm -hmm. all of a sudden. Wow. Um, so. The baseball thing, you know, baseball is like my first love. Mm. I love baseball and I'll never, it'll never leave me. As my baseball uh, experience broadened mm -hmm. and my network broadened, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the players and, and people affiliated with um, Major League Baseball mm -hmm. that I had grown up with since I was a kid would tell me about um, Korean players that came mm -hmm. to play mm -hmm. in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the first players that ever came into the U.S. was Channel Park. Yes. And through him, uh, my network grew. Mm -hmm. And as more players started to come from Korea, mm -hmm. um, I was always in Seattle mm -hmm. greeting them. Um, Shin Soo Chu, mm -hmm. who plays for the Cleveland Indians now, yes. um, was also a Seattle Mariners prospect mm -hmm. at the time when I had just graduated from college. Mm -hmm. And I was also introduced to him mm -hmm. uh, when he first got drafted to the Mariners. Nice. And uh, him and I hit it off real well, and we became like a young Tong Zeng kind of like older brother, younger older, brother. Yeah, older brother, younger brother situation. And um, you know, I took care of him for the next ten years. Nice. You know, um, so Shinsu and I had had built this relationship mm -hmm. over the past ten years, and and uh, he's been a really good, you know, Tong Zeng. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so then, fast forward again to. Korea team, your involvement right. in so you having Major League that awesome baseball, suit. <laughs> Major League Baseball knew that I had a lot of relationships mm -hmm. with Korean baseball players. Mm -hmm. And not only that, they knew me from, from a personal standpoint mm -hmm. ever since I was a kid. Mm. How's um, that? Well, I was always involved in not just being a fan, but I had a lot of family friends within the Seattle Mariners organization. Oh, okay. So I was a familiar face at the ballpark. Okay. Um, I was an employee, I wasn't an employee or an mm -hmm. affiliated member of the team, mm -hmm. but because I was there so often, people mm -hmm. just recognized me from being around. I see. Um, so Major League Baseball had once asked me in 2009 mm -hmm. uh, that they're doing the World Baseball Classic again. It was their second second time doing mm -hmm. the tournament. And um, Shinsu, uh, who was also uh, pending mm -hmm. to, you know, discussing his, to, to join the Korean national mm -hmm. team, had a little issue because he wasn't, uh, Physically, hundred percent. I see. You know, he had a sore arm, and, mm -hmm. and the Cleveland Indians were a little bit worried about him playing. Mm -hmm. But the KBO wanted him to play. Mm -hmm. The KBO is the Korean Baseball yes. Organization. They want him to play. So it was kind of a tug of war, mm -hmm. pressure match between mm -hmm. who's going to get him and who's yeah. not. Um, so MLB had called me and asked me if I could kind of be in the middle and 
and come along and help Shinsu so he doesn't feel so burdened. Mm -hmm. um, because I knew the KBO well and I knew MLB well, maybe I could be like a cushion between mm -hmm. the two to, to you know, create a to create a stronger alliance. So much were you there as a liaison between the MLB and the KBO? Were you there as just Shinsu's friend? Were you there as a translator only? Well, um, they they contract me as liaison. So mm -hmm. um, the main reason was to you know um, to help Shinsu. I see. So you know, not only was I there to just take care of him, but I threw him a little BP. Mm -hmm. You know, played catch with him here and there. Mm -hmm would translate for the trainers in Korean mm -hmm. and in English to make sure that Shinsu was okay. Mm -hmm. And then I would tell Major League Baseball, Cleveland Indians, oh, he's looking better today. I think mm -hmm. he can play kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. and uh, that was kind of my job. But then it ended up being the translator for the, for the manager of the team mm -hmm. and then the translator to the players of the team, mm -hmm. um, taking care of the reporters that weren't taken care of when they need to get into the ballpark. Yes. Um, so I ended up lo doing lots of everything um, at the time. <laughs> This is while um, you were still working at Sony, so it wasn't it was, like you quit to to go there. You'd taken some vacation time, was that right? I took a week vacation time without telling him what I was exactly doing. Okay. And um, without telling Sony what you were doing. Right. Okay. You know, because vacation is vacation, I can mm -hmm. do whatever I want right. with it. Um, but the vacation started getting extended little by little by little mm. because um, I didn't think we would get to the finals. <laughs> Um, but we kept winning and winning and winning, and I was like, oh, man, what am I going to do? i got to go back to work. <laughs> How did that go over? Um, well, a day passed, and it was fine. But the next day, uh, it was a game versus Mexico. Yes. Korea versus Mexico. And Oral Hershiser asked me if I could do a quick interview mm -hmm. on TV. But I didn't realize that it was going to be national TV. We really appreciate Kyu Lee joining us here. He is the uh, Team South Korea liaison. Exactly what's involved in that job, Q? It's ever changing every day. I, you know, I wake up in the morning and I get a phone call, and you know, I might be in, I might be in the game in the sixth inning. Who knows? I don't think they could make a difference if I put on a uniform or not. Give us some insight to the culture and the way the guys act at the hotel and back in the locker room. What's it like in a Korean locker room? You know, it's uh, it's pretty laid back, just like the ma Major League Baseball. You know, it's a little more quiet. You know. Uh, Culturally, when elders are around, they're very respectful to uh, the elders, so they're very quiet. When and I forgot the fact that it was going to be ESPN. And everyone will be watching Long that. Long story short, mm -hmm. my boss caught me on TV <laughs> and was like, what are you doing in San Diego? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you would be in the office. What the heck are you doing down there? Wow. And practically, I got caught. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I thought he was going to fire me, but it, it was more like, I can't believe you didn't tell me that you were going to go to the World Baseball Classic. You should have mm -hmm. told me from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I would have told you to go. Because he's a huge supporter of baseball, right? right? Um, take all the time you need. Mm -hmm. Come back whenever you want, kind of thing. And um, <laughs> Nice. And I was like, wow. What a relief. Right. It was wow. a huge relief. And then I went back to work again. You must have felt a great relief. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a huge weight off my shoulders. It definitely yeah. was, yeah. So, so then you went back to Sony, but you know, there are some great uh, photos of you in the uh, Korean team uniform, and that experience must have been pretty incredible for you. Definitely. It, it, it was uh, extremely surreal and mm -hmm. um, mind-boggling, and mm -hmm. um, had the shivers going through my bones, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I, wasn't a player on, I wasn't a player on the team, but um, to be able to have an actual uniform, yeah. um, to have the tickle on my chest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I felt like I was actually playing for Korea, mm -hmm. um, even though I wasn't, I was. Mm -hmm. And um, it was definitely an honor, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to be a part of a, an Olympic-esque event yes. where countries are competing against each other mm -hmm. to, um, you know, achieve a common goal. Mm -hmm. It was uh, definitely exciting. There's so much more that I think that a lot of our audience members would probably want to hear from you. And I think that we still have probably uh, a lot more to be able to talk about. But unfortunately, because of time, we might have to kind of end soon. But one thing I'd like to be able to say is that you know, how amazing is it that your life uh, thus far has been about teamwork? You seem like a very hands-on kind of guy. You're not just about you, but you're about making everyone look good and work good together. and 
that this has been your life thus far. I can only imagine what the future holds for you because you are the kind of guy that everyone wants on their team. Sony, Sony wanted you on their team. Uh, you know, Blush wants you on their team. Sai wants you on his team. The Korean Baseball League and the NBL want you on their team. So it's not a surprise to me to hear that you've done so well thus far. So I can only uh, wish you all the best. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I hope to maybe someday be on your team as well. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> You're on the interview Anytime. team, so uh, you've got that, you know, one thing there. So uh, so thank you again for sharing your amazing no, stories. No, thank you. I appreciate that, that, um, that you see it like that. Um, I take a lot of pride in trying to make, you know, things into that kind of situation and giving, where, giving credit where credit's due. And mm -hmm. I think um, if you give credit where credit's due, people are gonna work that much harder yes. to um, help each other out. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, that's what creates excitement and synergy. And uh, that's what I'm all about. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for joining our program. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Again. you.